Like partners are cherry picking from this information to use as criticism to make themselves right in relationships. This over pathologizing is deadly to a relationship. Did you push record? Thanks for joining us today on Second Act TV. I'm so happy to welcome Dr. Gary Salyer back to Second Act. Gary, thank you so much for joining me again. Thank you for having me, Silky. Great to be here. I I'm, I'm always love having you. Gary, of course, the, is the author of Safe to Love Again, How to Release the Pain of Past Relationships and Create the Love You Deserve. A big, big topic here on Second Act. And in that regard, I want to talk to you about something today that you actually brought to my attention. I had not heard that, that what you're seeing in your, in, in your practice with a lot of the couples that come to you, you refer to it as pathologizing a relationship. It came up, we talked about some labels. I asked you about another topic and you said, you know, I'm just so tired of people labeling everything because of what they find online and they come to me and they tell me what's wrong with them. <laughs> and I, I, I thought that was really interesting. I, I want to read you the definition really fast of pathologizing and then throw it over to you. They say that it's where we over diagnose ourselves and those around us. The quick definition provides by Google describes pathologizing to regard or treat something or someone as psychologically abnormal or unhealthy. Now, why would that possibly stand in the way of fixing our relationship? <laughs> well, <clears throat> what I've been noticing, and it's, been, and it's kind of been the last two or three years, there have been more and more with the, the growth of the internet, more and more you know, therapists who do telesummits, they do workshops, you know, maybe online webinars, workshops, podcasts. And this is giving beautiful, wonderful information to people. But the problem is, is when a clinical psychologist talks about, like, say, borderline personality disorder, uh, narcissistic personality disorder. Now, there's certain characteristics that uh, are part of these disorders, but you've pretty much got to have all of them. In any one human being, which one of us haven't been a little narcissistic at times, a little more self-centered, right? Which one of us haven't had an explosive episode where anger got out of control? That does not mean we have the personality disorder. And what I'm hearing is it's like partners are cherry picking from, these, from this information to use as criticism to make themselves right in relationships. I have had multiple couples, uh, uh, several couples come in and it looks like this. You have a couple of sessions and you're working on what their usual patterns, their dueling are. And then like after one session, about an hour later, uh, he calls me and says, you know, I, I, I just want to let you know, uh, I don't think you got all of it. I don't think you got all of it because, you know, my therapist and what I'm hearing on these podcasts is uh, you know, she really is border. And then I literally about 45 minutes later, she calls me and says, you know, I, I'm not sure if you noticed, uh, maybe you didn't notice it, but my therapist and what I'm hearing on these workshops I'm going to is that he's narcissistic. <laughs> he's a narcissist. And so now, and both of them have this horrible partner image that they've taken criticism, normal run of the mill criticism that all spouses do, and they have beefed it up on steroids of clinical research and they've over pathologized each other. And what the problem is for love is the biggest thing partners react to is the negative partner image of each other. Oh my God, you think that of me? How dare you think that of me, right? I can't believe I'm so hurt you would think I'm selfish. I'm so hurt you would think that I just blow up for no good reason, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. If you do this, you blow it up and it is so frigging painful. It will split a couple right down the, the tube. This over pathologizing is deadly to a relationship. What's interesting is that, you know, I think we all agree that being with a narcissist, for example, it, it, mm -hmm. it, you know, can be just devastating and that yes. it is important to have that awareness. And, and we put that awareness out there. You and I have discussed that on a different segment. We'll link to it. And 
it's true what you say. After we run these segments, I get comments, I get emails. You know, all of a sudden, it's like, wow, I didn't know this. You know, I didn't know. Thank you so much. But all of a sudden, it's like everybody's a narcissist. And I'm not saying that maybe we did awake some people then that needed to be aware of this and look for that. But I can totally see where now all of a sudden you make that fit because you can put a label on something when, when, when really that, that may not be the case. Yeah, it's, it's the professional diagnosis used uh, sort of anecdotally by someone who really doesn't know the full thing. Have I been had to tell people and couples, uh, I'm afraid we're dealing with a borderline here? Yes. Have I had to say, yeah, there's... Uh, the husband is a narcissist. Yep, but this, these are in the these are mostly outliers to what I call normal middle class craziness, <laughs> right? And what I'm talking about is a goal is the is the humility to know that um, you just applying it to your partner uh, without uh, you going in and someone seeing both of you together, <laughs> not just your interpretation to someone else. The the therapist needs to actually witness. The behavior to make a that assessment, and I think it's a Goldilocks zone of information. You know, too little, and you're not aware, and you get trapped, and you could date a narcissist or get trapped in a borderline, and there's no good. This information is necessary because borderline and 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 a narcissistic behavior has been on the upswing since about 2005. So there's more like that. On the other hand, just like Goldilocks, you know, you know, too much is a bad thing too. You know, to take those and to start having a filter ways anybody I meet is going to be narcissistic or borderline. If we look too much, we will find it. And it, it, it doesn't do couples any good to be looking out for it so much that we see normal behavior, which the typical imperfections of humanity, and we start pathologizing it. Now, You've got two people who are seeing each other in the worst light. And who wants that? Yeah, nobody does. What's the fine line? Or what, you know, how would you counsel someone, or, or maybe not counsel, but on this like a podcast like this, how do you advise someone to maybe check whether or not they're doing this? When is it just, you know, when is a good awareness? Yes, cue in on this, cue in on that. And when are you pathologizing? Well, I think, you know, when people have been in a, uh, uh, in a series of bad relationships, they can be on the lookout for it. Now, it's true if they haven't done the work. If someone has a tendency to pick selfish people because they don't have a, a right to have their own needs met, they could very well be attracted to the narcissistic type. This is where this gets complicated. But it's also true that if they're looking out for it and they find someone who's pretty secure and the first time that person does something uh, a little selfish or self-centered, which let's face it, I'm sure that neither you or I have ever done anything of that in the last 10 of years. Of course not. <laughs> of course not, right? You know, then we can drive away those people. It's, if you're going to make a, that assessment, the, you re, it's not just you telling your therapist and enrolling them in your story. They need to see that person to get an independent judgment. I have sometimes seen those categories where the spouse did not, and the, but more times than not, I've had to say, no, they have some characteristics when they're honked off, you know, <laughs> you know, but not typically. It's, there's a difference between those characteristics which we can all get and the full-fledged personality disorder where there's really a split psyche and things are hugely out of proportion. Yeah, I think, uh, I read this somewhere, is that the when you pathologize or you have this, this overly driven need to find information, that that's actually driven out of your own anxiety and fear. Exactly. If you know, is like what I talked about in previous episodes, you know, if you have these missing rights I talk about, so I always, I feel unworthy, so I can't have my needs met, or I feel disempowered, right? So I, I, I always find relationships that I lose myself, or they're going to be a little dominating. It can be easy to have us to find people that are more narcissistic or borderline in those cases, right? But it's also true that in pathologizing them, 
what you're really doing is trying to fix it by by looking outward rather than inward. This is a pattern and we're trying to explain, oh, it's on them. I see the problem isn't my missing right to have my needs met and I feel unworthy. It's that I always get narcissistic takers or, oh my God, I can't create my own experience. I feel so disempowered. Uh, you know, uh, oh, all women are, are borderlines, you know, and that will not work. It's It's an escape route looking outward rather than looking in and go, gosh, I wonder what part of me is is needing this experience because it was the only thing it learned to be safe with. Or you could even say, I wonder what part of me is setting up that behavior. Uh, that's in couples. I would die if a partner came up to me, you know? Uh, I noticed that they tend to get really, really angry um, and they blow up a little bit, but you know, it's always preceded by a, a some sort of snarky comment by me. <laughs> you Doesn't never have. hear that last, right? <laughs> that's a that's a great yeah it's a great point we'd never really look inward what what is it that so I, we're starting to come towards the end of the segment you know the takeaway again is over pathologizing really maybe says more about you than it does them what how, how what kind of good advice can we leave here that that maybe stops someone from you know maybe this isn't helping so the thing uh, let's put this in the positive. Love is uh, what John Gottman calls a positive sentimental override. It means that we that we have good feelings that give them the benefit of the doubt. Oh, they must be having a bad day. Oh, you know, there's that cute little wounded five-year-old again in them that I've learned to love, right? In an endure, not in an enduring way, but in an endearing way. The heart and soul of a lasting relationship is keeping a positive perspective. This is from the Gottman research. But which one of us wants our partner to think of us in any of those ways? Mm -hmm. If we give that, you will get it back. Mm -hmm. That's you know, if we give BS, we get BS, right? Yeah. Uh, so the big thing here is this is messing with the the positives partner images that we all crave for, for someone to see our essence and to cherish us. And yes, see our woundedness, to see our trips, our humanity, and they are good with all of us, right? Yeah. Now, I'm not saying, you know, yes, I'm not saying putting up with that type of abuse on the outlier that we're talking about. But in normal relationships, it is important to keep in mind that I need to have, try to create the best possible partner image. Now, I know that in any given circumstance, sometimes that isn't possible without deeper work. But the general principle is, is this helping us stay positive? Sometimes things do need to get worked out. But if we're not careful, we can set up some patterns mm -hmm. that really will predispose us to the very things that split lasting love. And if you want a lasting relationship, you won't have to pick a good partner but there has to be the place for intimacy for you to be fully human too. And pathologizing and being fully human are, you know, they're not the best combination. We all have our, our dark side. We all have our weak side. We all have our stuff we're working on. And in that middle zone is where we need to have positivity as well as acknowledging, yeah, we got our stuff to work on too. Yeah, great advice, Gary. Thank you so much. We will, of course, link to all of your information if people want to get in touch with you directly. Your book, a great read. I recommend it to anybody. And we'll see you next time on Second Act TV. If you haven't already done so, please be sure to subscribe to our channel. The button is right here. And if there's a topic that you'd like to have us cover, please visit our website, secondact.tv. There's a little red suggestion box in the upper right-hand corner of our site. Just click on that, send us an email. We'd love to hear from you. See you next time.